Let me welcome you. My name is Dane Scott. I direct the Center for Ethics here at the University of Montana. And we have this excellent group of panelists to discuss this very important issue. And I'd like to say they're all here on pizza. It was all they got for doing this. And so we thank you uh, that they, they're willing to do this very important topic. Also, like I'm very pleased to see so many students in the crowd. Thank you for coming on this issue. And it's a great mix of folks. Hopefully we'll have a lively discussion here, and at the end of it, we'll be able to ask, you can join in and have some questions. Uh, but I'd like to first introduce our panelists, and then we'll turn it over to Mark Connell, who will tell you a little bit about the decision. And then uh, I'll, I'll start by introducing our moderator. Uh, Mark Hansen is a good friend of the Center for Ethics. I don't know, you've probably heard him do his radio commentary on Montana Public Radio. Uh, he does an excellent job on that, and I appreciate it. He's a bioethicist, which is very fortunate for me to have here on campus, because I'm not. Uh, and it's a lot of help to me. And he's also a professor at the College of Technology and Medical Ethics, and also a lecturer in liberal studies here at UM. Uh, starting on the end down there is Michael Moore. Uh, he came over from, uh, uh, excuse me, Gallatin Gateway. He's a legislator. Uh, from uh, House District 7, a Republican. Uh, this is his first term. He served on the Judiciary Committee and the Health and uh, Human Services Committee. And in his spare time, he's a carpenter. And he also has taken some, uh, some good theology class. We got to talk about it. Next to him is Mark Connell. And Mark has been, for 30 years, a litigation attorney at a small firm here in Missoula. But he's uh, been a civil rights and constitutional uh, lawyer who's been on some very big cases, including uh, representing the plaintiffs in the Baxter decision, or the Baxter case before the Supreme Court. Uh, next to Mark is Bernie Frank, and Bernie has been working as a disabilities rights lawyer for 25 years, and right now she is the executive director of disability rights in Montana. And uh, I'd like to thank Stephen Specker, who helped me put this panel together. And uh, he is, uh, been, he's a retired oncologist, I'm sure many of you know Stephen, here in town. Uh, and Stephen, in 1979, started Hospice of Missoula. And uh, Marianne uh, Sladish Lance is the Vice President of Mission Leadership at St. Patrick's Hospital uh, and Health and Science Center, and a member of St. Patrick's Hospital <coughs> Ethics Committee. And then Dick Barrett who's a good friend, and he's been a professor here at UN and <coughs> this right for 37 years, now emeritus, and in his retirement, he is now state legislator of this district here around the university, uh, House District 93, not 90 as it is printed on the board. So, you can have that. Uh, so um, at this point, what we're going to do is Mark, since he's been so closely involved in this, uh, will give us a summary and sort of provide a context uh, for the decision that was made by the Montana Supreme Court. And then we're going to turn it over to our moderator, uh, Mark Hansen. And as you can see, there are four questions on the handout that we'd like to go through. But actually, we're probably going to maybe skip question number three and do one, two, and four. But Mark will tell you about that. But thank you again for coming, and thank you to our panel. Mark? Thank you. Probably the reason most of us in the room are here today is because of what the Supreme Court of Montana did on December 31st. Uh, with just a handful of hours left in the year, the Supreme Court issued its landmark decision in Baxter versus State of Montana. Uh, that was a case I was privileged to represent the plaintiffs. And uh, as they've asked me, I'll give you just a brief 
three or four minute thumbnail sketch of what happened in that case, which might help set the stage for your understanding of the legal and then maybe the ethical issues that are involved. Uh, the Baxter case, as we called it, involved a group of plaintiffs who sued the state of Montana seeking to have the, that we were seeking declaratory judgment. We're not asking for money damages. We're asking for the court to rule as a matter of law that people in this state have the right to aid in dying. And aid in dying, as we defined it, and as is generally known uh, in the field, uh, involves a mentally competent, terminally ill person who uh, is under extreme stress, pain, and suffering at the end of life, a person who has the, the ability to ad self administer. Uh, and that person can then go to his or her doctor under aid and dying uh, principles and ask the doctor to provide a prescription for a lethal dose of medication. The idea at that point is the patient then takes that prescription and decides whether to uh, fill it, first of all, may not, decides if, whether to fill it, whether to take it. And we know from other states that have this right, very often patients will take the prescription and not fill it, or, or fill it and then not use the medication. The, the lawsuit was designed to have the court rule whether Montana should have the right to make those choices for themselves. Uh, as you may know, there are two states in the United States, Washington and Oregon, who have had that right. They, they adopted the, the aid and dine uh, as a matter of the vote. It was a citizen initiative. And in those states it passed, it was challenged and it passed again. Montana is the only state that has legalized aid and dine judicially through a court process. Okay, briefly what happened is we represented uh, Bob Baxter, who was an elderly gentleman who had lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, there wasn't any question leukemia was eventually going to kill him, as it did in the middle of our case. Uh, Steve Stolb, another gentleman who had a particularly difficult uh, degenerative disease, and four doctors from the Missoula area who treat terminally ill people. And our contentions were that those individuals collectively had what we call legal standing. They had a stake in the controversy. Either they wanted that right for themselves, or the doctors wanted to be wanted to be protected against the possibility that if they provided aid and dying services, they couldn't be prosecuted for homicide, which they could be unless the court ruled in this manner. Um, so we presented the case to the district court in Helena. Judge Mc Dorothy McCarter is our judge. And as plaintiffs, we argued essentially these three things. We argued that under the criminal law of Montana, uh, consent ought to be a defense to a doctor. So in other words, if a doctor says, if, if, the, if the state of Montana comes knocking on the doctor's door and says, you helped uh, cause the death of this person, that is homicide. Uh, you're subject to prosecution uh, and the full impact of the criminal laws. We wanted the, the, the law to be declared to be that the doctor could raise the defense of consent. Normally, when you give, uh, uh, w w when you go to your child and say, here's $5. Uh, go out and buy lunch. Uh, if the child takes the money, you can't be prosecuted because the, ch the child got the money through your consent. That's the, the fundamental of what we were arguing. There's a glitch in the self-defense law, however, which says that, self that consent cannot be a defense in a criminal case if it is against public policy to allow it to be so. Okay, so for example, we know in Montana that uh, a woman can give consent to sexual relations. If that woman is under 16 years of age, she can't. Public policy will not allow her to consent. And if, if she has sex with a, a, a man while she's under age, he can be prosecuted notwithstanding her consent. It's the same idea. So that was one theory. The primary theories we brought the case under, however, were constitutional. We have an unusually uh, progressive state constitution that has explicit rights of privacy and human dignity. Uh, the other states don't have the right of dignity and only a few states have the right of privacy. And all these issues surrounding those two phrases have been subject to great interpretations by the court. They're still being fleshed out. And, and briefly, because I, I will try to keep my remarks uh, fairly short, I, I want to give you a sense of what we were arguing because primarily this was a constitutional law case or so we thought. In Montana, here are the precedents that we asked the court to rely upon and to apply in our case. 
These were cases from, that the Supreme Court had ruled earlier. On privacy, our Supreme Court had said, the right of privacy, and here's a quote, think about how this, this might apply in your lives. It guarantees each individual the right to make medical judgments affecting his or her bodily integrity and health in partnership with a chosen health care provider, free from the interference of the government. We said that ought to apply to aid in dying. The right of dignity has been interpreted as demanding that people have for themselves the moral right and moral responsibility to confront the most fundamental questions about the meaning and value of their own lives and the intrinsic value of life in general, answering to their own consciences and convictions. So we went to the Supreme Court, with the, we sued the state of Montana, and both sides agreed pretty much on what the facts were. This was something called summary judgment. We didn't have a trial. We stipulated to what the facts were, and we asked the court to say, how do those rights apply, and do they, in fact, guarantee the uh, protection of doctors from being prosecuted if they help a patient in this way? Uh, we, the, the state of Montana argued, number one, that uh, the doctors didn't have standing because it wasn't their lives that were at stake. They argued that uh, no one had ever been prosecuted for aid and dying in the history of the state, although there was a doctor who got prosecuted and sort of did that apply or not. But they did say it was illegal and that finally that the constitutional rights do not apply. And fundamentally what they argued, and you hear a lot about this today, is leave it to the legislature. They argued courts should keep your hands off of this. This is a matter for the people to decide. Our response very briefly was the voters, the majority, doesn't decide what's in the Constitution. We have a 200-year tradition in this country that the courts decide what the Constitution means and how it will apply. So those are some, some of the things we decide, we argue. Uh, Judge McCarter issued a decision uh, in um, December of 2007, 2008, excuse me, in which she said the constitutional rights both apply, dignity and uh, privacy, and doctors cannot be prosecuted. Okay, that then was appealed by the, Monta by the Attorney General's office representing the state of Montana. We went before the Montana Supreme Court last September. Uh, there was a little bit of urgency to the case because one of the justices, Judge Justice Warner, w had announced he was going to retire from the bench on December 31st. And so after we argued the case, both sides knew that the clock was ticking. And sure enough, as it often happens in the law, on the very last moment, on the afternoon of December 31st, the court handed down his decision. And his decision was quite a surprise to a lot of people. What the Supreme Court ruled was, they said, and they, they used an old tenet of the law, which is that the courts are reluctant to, to decide constitutional issues of great import if they can avoid doing so. <laughs> and they ducked the question. I think they'd admit they ducked the question. What they said is, we're not going to decide that question today because we don't need to do so. They said, we are convinced that the plaintiffs were right on the first question, which had to do with that public policy issue. They said, we believe, and we so hold, they said on December 31st, that um, a, a doctor, if he provides aid in dying to his patient, assuming the patient is mentally competent, terminally ill, and can take the medication for himself or herself, that that doctor cannot be prosecuted. He can raise the defense of consent of his patient. The patient asked me to do this, and that the public policy of Montana they held supports this. Okay, that was a landmark ruling. The country has not had a ruling of that, like that before. But interestingly, that throws open a, a new step in the future that might have been closed if they decided on constitutional grounds. The Constitution is changed by a supermajority of the citizens voting to do so. It's a hard thing to do, deliberately so. We want to have stability of constitutions. The public policy of the state, however, is often derived from statutes. Statutes are passed by legislators. So the court, by not deciding on constitutional grounds, said, we decide that this is legal in Montana. And the rest of us who read the opinion said, hmm, that means it's going to be an interesting legislature coming up. <laughs> okay. um, I think I'll just stop there. Uh, I wanted to just kind of set the stage for you, because some of what we'll be talking about are perhaps will be what people think about those constitutional rights of privacy and dignity and about some of the problems that this court decision could lead to. 
or some of the solutions and what the legislature might do it. Thank you. Okay, thanks Mark and I um, also want to add my thank you to you all for attending and to this uh, wonderful panel for the Center for Ethics. It's my uh, distinct privilege to moderate it but also my um, great challenge to try and do so fairly so we'll um, try to have a great conversation here and basically what we want to do is is um, we have these questions around which to structure our discussion and I will pose a question and have a couple of our panelists lead off and then invite some conversation among the panelists in terms of just being able to respond to some of the initial remarks and uh, so hopefully throughout the evening people will be able to speak what's on their mind and what's most important to them so and again we'll try to have some time for some audience questions at the uh, conclusion of the session tonight so uh, to jump right into this um, as um, Mark as well stated the court has uh, put it upon the legislature now to make a decision what it wants to do and so let's start um, first with some conversation about that and perhaps the, the uh, I'll state the question here basically as it's printed in the program um, the Baxter decision currently allows physician assisted suicide or physician aid in dying as you want to define it as an option for health care should the legislature take steps to overturn this decision or should it move ahead to craft guidelines for how physician assisted suicide or aid in dying should be practiced uh, so perhaps it's most appropriate to start with some initial comments from our two legislators on the panel um, mm -hmm. I'll just uh, start with Dick for a few minutes and then ask uh, Michael Moore to have some comments in, <coughs> excuse me, in dealing with this issue, what I've always found is that people bring their personal experiences to bear on. And so I'm going to tell you about a couple of personal experiences that I've had uh, with my family, with my parents, and try and explain what the, I think the relevance of those are to, this, to the question. My father was a retired Episcopal bishop. He was 93 years old, and he was on... Uh, in renal failure and he was on kidney dialysis. He didn't enjoy his life very much at that point. He didn't like the food he had to eat. He didn't like his dependence on being transported for dialysis. He didn't like spending time in the hospital. And he decided he'd had enough. And so he announced one day that he was done with dialysis. Uh, his family gathered and in a short period, about a week, he died. Now, that's perfectly legal, of course, in the state of Montana. It would, this wasn't in Montana, it was in California, but if it had been, it was legal in California, and if it had been here, it would have been legal as well. Some years before that, my mother had um, metastatic breast disease uh, and was uh, dying in, in her bones. She was bedridden, she was in pain, she was taking large doses of pain medications, she had been a very active woman, a very mentally alert woman, a woman who enjoyed reading, who enjoyed watching movies, who, who enjoyed life intensely, but no longer could um, enjoy life uh, intensely. Uh, she couldn't read because she couldn't stay focused because of her medications. She was a great uh, admirer of Joe Montana and Jerry Rice and the 49ers, but she couldn't watch a 49ers game because she wouldn't, couldn't stay awake for it. And one day she woke up and it broke her arm. Her arm just broke because of a lesion. Uh, and she said, that's it, I'm done. And she had access to morphine and, and, and knew how to use it because she was a retired nurse. And she took it and died that day. Okay. Now, what's the relevance of that to what we're talking about here tonight? What the Supreme Court said when it talked about public policy, it said, that aid in dying, that it, would, that it would be incongruous to find that what my father did was legal, but what my mother did wasn't. Okay. That there was some criminal act involved in providing my mother with the medications that ended her life. That there was some criminal act involved in that, but there wasn't any kind of criminal act involved in my father's decision to end his life. They're very closely in related decisions. And what the Supreme Court said is it would be incongruous to believe that public policy in Montana should, would prohibit what my mother did when it allows what my father did. Okay. 
And I think that's right. I think it would be incongruous. I think it would be a terrible mistake for us to decide that we wanted to prohibit aid in dying when we in fact allow people the right to refuse treatment, to suspend treatment, we even allow people the right, the dubious right, to starve themselves to death. Okay. We allow all of that because people, but because people have, we re respect the notion that people shouldn't have to submit to treatment that they don't want, that they shouldn't have to lead a life that they don't want to lead. If we do that, we shouldn't surely deny them the right to end their life. We shouldn't require them to stay alive under circumstances that mean, either mean that they're in pain or they must accept treatment. It's not consistent. It is incongruous. And so I believe that what the policy of the state should be is that we should uh, allow the practice of physician assistance in dying, but that in allowing that, we should go beyond what the Supreme Court did, which was basically simply decriminalize it, and we should go to the point of saying, uh, not only is, is, is this going to be allowed, not only is it not criminal, but also provide the kinds of protections and regulations um, that are of concern to people when the practice, when the, when, when, when the practice is contemplated. Thanks. Uh, Michael, you have a response on <clears throat> Well, I don't know if say it's a response per se. Um, I should begin by, by saying that I'm, uh, I'm a Roman Catholic and I, uh, I don't speak for the Diocese of Helen. I don't speak for the Diocese of Great Falls. Uh, I don't speak for my constituents in this issue as a, as a representative. I, I think that I've been chosen to participate in this panel uh, because of the fact that uh, I, I'd like to speak to the theory, uh, theoretical consideration of what's at stake here. And uh, I have a master's degree in dogmatic theology and, and I think uh, that is what I'd li I'd like to address my comments in regard to this. So while Dick speaks of things in a practical manner, I speak of them theoretically. and. Um, from the perspective that I hold, this, uh, as Mark has uh, indicated, this comes out of a uh, progressive constitution. I find it rather fascinating that it's a progressive constitution, but it's really a, a rather libertarian perspective on what someone can do with, uh, with their own health uh, and the end-of-life choice. Um, and that said, I guess the, uh, the way I'd like to present the consideration is that it's, it's really an act of judicial positivism, wherein uh, the judicial branch of government has stepped out and said, quote unquote, nothing prohibits uh, this from taking place. There's nothing to prevent it from, from occurring. And so it, it steps out of that realm and, and, and leaves it entirely up to the realm of uh, the other facets of government, in this case, the, the legislature to consider how we're going to proceed in this manner, in a very delicate and difficult manner, certainly. Um, and as I say, so it's an act in my mind of judicial positivism, which reflects uh, philosophical positivism. And philosophical positivism comes to us from Auguste Comte, who was a uh, 19th century philosopher, who basically said, uh, 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 paraphrasing, he said, it's a tendency to limit human knowledge to what can be known by the tenets of science. And this becomes very important because we simply look at the human person, we look at life itself only under the lens of what a microscope might re reveal or a medical practitioner might reveal. We no longer look at life in the context of the broader consideration of what was known as metaphysics. And metaphysics is the uh, philosophical underpinning for, for Western, uh, Western thought, ultimately, um, and that coming to us from Aristotle. So I'm talking here largely about philosophy, and, and uh, I hope you can stay with me on, on this, but metaphysics basically presents the idea that uh, the human being, the human person, is held in both their essence and their existence by nature of a, uh, a sovereign god. So we are a creature in relation to a creator. Uh, and in this sense, then, we are a contingent being. 
and none of us can ultimately decide what uh, our lives hold. And by that, just to give an example, um, I as a human person, I can't survive more than three minutes without air. I can't survive more than three days without water. And depending upon my uh, physical condition, I can't survive more than three months or so without food. So in that sense, I'm a completely contingent being on uh, the nutritive faculties or air, as the case may be, water, as the case may be, in order to sustain myself. And ultimately, this is the reality that we're interposing here from a, uh, a political perspective. We're weighing into a judgment that attends to a much broader philosophical question. And in that sense, it's very delicate and very difficult. And, and I don't uh, profess to have a specific answer to it, but I will say that um, I will share Bishop George Leo Thomas, who's the bishop of the, uh, the Helena Diocese, the comment that he made uh, in regard to the ruling that the dignity of the human person cannot be conferred by the state nor can that dignity be taken from them. So this becomes the heart of the discussion and, and how to legislate around the question of human dignity. What is the, uh, the measure of one human life? And to try to take ourselves back out of that libertarian perspective and consider this question becomes uh, a pretty grave challenge for myself or anybody else who's a, a sitting legislator you know, 150 of us who are all citizen legislators. We come from all walks of life, and we don't have uh, necessarily the background in order to prepare ourselves for the depth of this discussion. So I think it'll be very, very challenging in the legislative session to sort through this and do so in a manner that gives fair hearing to all the facets and the ramifications of what this ruling uh, brings to us. So I'll leave it at that for the moment, and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, Michael. I mean, we can see that this question raises uh, the, a spectrum of very important practical issues, but um, also deeply philosophical questions and assumptions that any, that any decision that the legislator makes is, legislature makes is ultimately sort of relying on. So we've got a bit of a, a breadth here to work in. Um, let me see if anyone on the panel first wants a, a response to what's been said so far. Thank you. Um, I want to speak to the disability issues in the next question, but in terms of legislation, one of the things that I think might be something that the legislatures could consider is that um, what the Supreme Court did is they decriminalized um, the act of physician-assisted suicide, saying it's not against public policy. And I believe that there, this is such a complicated question, it's such a complicated um, <coughs> public policy issue that instead of doing anything in terms of legislating the decision, what the legislature might consider doing is working on data collection and doing some studying around the issue before we jump off and start creating legislation that we're not necessarily sure what the impact is. I don't think the two states that have legalized um, physician-assisted suicide, Washington and Oregon, have collected enough data reliable data, sufficient data, to help guide us here in Montana. I don't think by the legislate, I'm not suggest, I guess I am suggesting sort of a punt, because it gives us time to think about what are the important questions to collect. And during this time, nobody's rights are being infringed, because the people that want to access physician-assisted suicide have gotten that. They got it through the fact that it's not against public policy. And those decisions get made in the privacy between them and their doctor. So that group of people won't lose anything if the legislature does nothing. And then the group of people that are very seriously concerned about this, at-risk populations, have the opportunity to say, we need to ask some really hard questions and collect some really good data. With regard to what we now understand uh, about what has been done here before, um, the information is actually substantial. Uh, in the state of Oregon, this has been going on for 12 years, and they collect data for every single patient. Every single patient has to go through a rigorous interview process, there are numerous forms that have to be filled out, there's certain criteria which we might talk about later, 
candidate selection for this. And all of this has to be done in a precise, duplicated fashion. And it is passed through committees and sometimes reviewed by uh, the state if there are problems in it. So there's a huge amount of data, actually, that's been collected over 12 years. And there are uh, over 400 patients who've been sampled. And the data has been carefully analyzed. And impressively, within that number of patients, uh, thus far, um, the selection of people uh, that, have, that have had physician-assisted dying uh, has been accurate with regard to the population that, that meets the, the criteria. Now, the analysis of that doesn't go into these philosophical issues. It is mostly clinical data, but one could derive analysis by going through that data. So I, th I don't believe that we're beginning uh, with a blank slate here at all. In fact, I think that we have a tremendous opportunity simply because we have all of those gears of data where people have been uh, <coughs> very cautious in looking at every single patient who's been entered into this process. And Seattle is doing the same. Seattle has just published, uh, or Washington State has just published their information, and they've had 36 patients this year and 76 applications. Um, and the other people did not take the medications or are still alive and have the option of taking the medications. It turns out that about a third of the patients never take the medication. So the, the major point is we have substantial information that we can study that is good information. Um, I think one of, the, one of the criticisms that's been made in terms of data collecting in, in Oregon is that uh, there's, the, there's the question of whether physicians or whether patients in fact can shop around for physicians who will in fact um, fill the, the requirements for diagnosis and prognosis and to evaluate their competency and that there's some data that data hasn't been collected about um, why they do that or whether there have been some disputes um, and that there, I think uh, the reporting forms are actually quite limited. Am I wrong about that? Is that the kind of thing exactly that, that you're looking toward? Do you correct. want to say more about what well, you need? I, I, <coughs> just, I just believe that Washington and Oregon are collecting some data and I think that proponents and opponents have taken that data and have managed to both use it to support their position. And instead of us arguing about the Oregon and Washington data, we should talk about what is it we think we need in Montana, craft some questions around that and some data collecting mechanisms to uh, be a little bit more careful in the process and thoughtful. Um, I know we're going to get to my presentation, but your da the data that has been collected has not taken into consideration a, some very at-risk groups of people. Um, and I think that that dialogue needs to happen. So. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, I've looked at the Oregon data, and as you might recognize from just the interest we see here tonight, we've seen around the state of Montana in connection with the Baxter case, uh, when Oregon passed aid and dying, the first state to do so, it was a matter of enormous public interest. Uh, they passed it by citizen initiative. It was challenged. It was challenged again. They passed it again. This has been studied by uh, bioethicists, by political commentators, by legislative committees. It's been studied enormously. Uh, um, a number of the things they studied, because there was a legitimate concern, and there still is a legitimate concern, of whether something of this sort is subject to abuse. For example, would family members pressure uh, their elderly relatives to die earlier so they could leave them the family fortune? That, that's been raised. Would people, uh, would minorities be uh, disadvantaged? Would they be singled out for pressure? Would people who don't have insurance be singled out for fear that they'll deplete the family coffers? Okay, um, these sorts of groups were particularly identified in the Oregon law as requiring study. And after 10 years, we've had multiple, multiple studies, peer-reviewed studies, that have concluded in Oregon, on the basis of the 12 years experience that Dr. Speckert alluded to, is that there have not been abuses. Okay, so the, the bugaboos that poor people 
are going to be are going to die unnecessarily because of having aid and dying available to them. That hasn't panned out. The idea that people who don't have insurance and are worried about paying their medical bills that they will be pressured into an early exit that hasn't panned out. The, the, the last thing I want to mention, I should have mentioned maybe in my <coughs> earlier remarks, to show you how uh, how <coughs> topical this is. As I said, the Supreme Court has ruled the ball is now passed to the legislature. The law in Montana right now is that doctors cannot be prosecuted for this. The other part of the, of the requirements for an eligible patient, remember I said mentally competent, terminally ill, adult who can self-administer, but also that can find a willing physician. That's the other part of it. So I, I wanted to disabuse anybody if they thought, well, this is not fair to doctors who may not agree with this decision. No one is saying the doctor has to participate. And if a patient goes to the doctor, in Montana, this is happening today. Uh, I got a call today from uh, some people who are concerned about a family member who's dying a very difficult death. Where can we find a physician? And one answer is, if your family physician doesn't want to participate in this, he's nervous, he has moral scruples against it, whatever, you're welcome to try another doctor. So this happens in many other forms of medicine, as you might know. Uh, reproductive freedom, other issues, where doctors sometimes are not comfortable, they send the patient elsewhere, uh, and that's happening today. Mark, could you um, clarify a little bit more in terms of the current state that we're in? I mean, now that the court has essentially punted it to the legislature, the legislature has not voted up or down or set the legislative guidelines. Um, obviously, uh, people are starting to ask about this. Um, what? Um, how does it work? I mean, a, a, a patient now goes to a physician and says, I want this. The, in essence, are Montanans a bit vulnerable here, lacking guidelines? Well, what the court did is it decided a broad question of law. It said, this, to, to, for a physician to provide aid in dying is not a criminal act in Montana, as long as the patient has asked for it, and the patient's mentally competent, terminally ill, and an adult. Okay. Um, uh, the legislature could seek to change the public policy that, that uh, girded the Supreme Court's decision. Uh, it, it's interesting to point out that even though it's legal now, the legislature could seek, for example, to say they could just pass a, a one-sentence statute that said the public policy of the state of Montana is hereby declared to be against aid and dying, and it shall be subject to criminal prosecution. If they did that, the, the, the intriguing thing for those of us in the legal business is that would throw it right back to the courts. Because we have this constitutional right of privacy and the constitutional right of dignity. The Supreme Court said, we're not touching those right now. So they're going to see what the legislature did. And when the legislature acts, if the legislature were to prohibit aid and dying or to restrict it in such a draconian way as to make it realistically impossible, for instance, they could say, you have to have a one-year waiting period between the time you first ask your, doc ask your doctor for the prescription and when he gives it. Well, that's going to essentially prohibit it for people who need it. So if that sort of thing were to happen, the courts may be asked to address this. Has the legislature gone too far? Uh, one other thing I'll mention that, uh, and, uh, that was intriguing. Judge McCarter at the district court level, and she decided for the plaintiffs and said, this is legal based on the Constitution. She, she issued her ruling in December, right before the next legislature sat. Everybody thought, what's the legislature going to do? The legislature didn't do anything. This issue has, has been, uh, has been uh, argued in, in various legislative committees and certainly in uh, public opinion-wise over the years. It's obviously a political hot potato. The legislature's got a real tough thing to do, trying to balance these philosophical constructs, the criminal law, what do the doctors want? Are there patient lobbies th that are uh, applying pressure? It's a tricky question. Well, right now, the legislature, if the, if the Supreme Court punted before, the legislature punted after Judge McCarter ruled. Now the Supreme Court has ruled. Nobody knows what they'll do next. I think Dick has probably a comment on that. I, well, it's not exactly on that. It's on the question of whether we should collect the data before we act. I. Um, <coughs> certainly think that if we uh, pass a bill uh, that, that creates um, a right to physician assistance in dying and creates a regulatory structure around the practice, 
um, and identifies areas of concern uh, with respect to public policy, we should then collect data afterwards to make sure that it's doing what we want it to do. But I must say that I'm completely at a loss to know what kind of data that we would collect ahead of the time that we ever had the policy that would tell us how the policy works. I don't know what that data would be. Well, I think I could answer that. Um, I think that there's uh, an awful lot of information we don't know about the availability of palliative care. And I'm sure that, you know, doctor, you might be able to talk about that from your experience. Plus we have a hospice physician. <laughs> which, is, which is perfect. Um, and I think in order for people to understand where I'm coming from, I sort of have to talk about the second question, which is the at-risk groups of people. Is that okay? Um, why don't we uh, Why don't we hear from the two doctors and then uh, okay. we'll move to the second question? I know Stephen, you wanted to get in. Uh, yeah, there were a couple of things. I think it is imperative uh, that the legislation go forward with this um, because of the situation that the Supreme Court has left us. In part because physicians generally are have enormous disease with this circumstance. Physicians want to do the right thing. They want to feel good about it. They want to know that they're responding to the, the terminal ills of their patients in an appropriate way, and they want to know that it is sanctioned and agreed with with the communities in which they live and from with their colleagues. Um, patients are calling. My phone number is not listed, and I had calls. Uh, I'm a retired physician. Um, so. A lot of the problem goes to the doctors. The patients are aware. This is something that is happening now in Montana. And physicians are reluctant. So they need to have guidelines. And part of the problem uh, about physicians in Oregon is all of this takes quite a bit of time. It, it represents a cultural shift uh, so that doctors can begin to feel comfortable. But one of the things that's happening there is the doctors who are given the second opinions, they're beginning to help. So sometimes it is hard to find a doctor who will help, and that's related to other things. It has to do with the fractionation of health care right now because people are going to a bunch of specialists, then they're dying, and suddenly they wonder who their doctor is. And these things are really critical for doctors because they need to know and understand their patients, and that takes time. So the continuity of care and the, the, the family practice physicians and the internists and so on really need to be involved. And that transition takes a while to get there. That's changing. Year by year, more and more physicians in Oregon are participating in the process because they're more and more comfortable with it. Some of the physicians who've given a second opinion are now are people who are, who are giving prescriptions. Um, the, the presence of palliative care in these communities uh, is very substantial. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my name is uh, Eric Kress and I'm a family physician, but I'm also the medical director of a, of a hospice here in town called Hospice in Missoula. And there's two hospices in Missoula, and Dr. Davis is here too. She's a medical director of another hospice as well. So um, I would say that, you know, as far as the availability, I think there is good availability when people want to access it. Uh, there's two quality hospices that do good work and are, are ready to help people in times of need. So I think there is availability of that. Um, you know, for instance, down the Bitterit, there's there's a hospice down there, and I think there's there's uh, there's two hospices in Hamilton, I think Aspen and, and Marcus Daly. So I think there are there's more and more awareness of it, and and that is one of the concerns we sort of have from a hospice organization is is to be the front leaders on this issue. We're a little bit nervous about it because of the fact that we are scared that we would not be able to serve people if we were sort of perceived as say let's let's just take it you know to a fairly uh, descriptive term let's say somebody said well the hospice they're just going to do a mercy killing okay and we've sort of come through the era of where hospices were sometimes perceived with people as a sort of well they're just going to put you out of your misery like the vet does with your dog or something and and I think we've all kind of worked through that phase of, well, we're here to enhance your life at the end of life. And um, that's 99% of what our job is. Now, there are different cards that can be dealt to people, and, 
And I would say 99% of the time there's no question the end of life issue never comes up with our patients that we deal with. And, uh, but you know, maybe 1% of the time with certain you know, really tough cards that people get dealt, medical cards that like just a bad disease and a lot of pain and suffering and they're fully conscious and you know, there's just, we just, palliation is, is not going that great or something, then, you know, that decision, that, that request can come up with our patients. It usually is directed to the nurses and most of the time the doctors don't ever hear it. The nurses hear it at the home or the, the chaplain or the social workers might hear it more. But it, in the past it's been kind of, well, that's not really available and we don't do that so we don't have to worry about it. But in the, you know, as the future, there, this may be available and, and, and so forth. Um, but the couple things that make us nervous about this are number one, uh, if we were to, to, to do this as part of our practice, we could maybe deny care to people that need palliative care because they perceived us as a mercy killing sort of organization. And that could, maybe there would be literally, you know, dozens of people that might say, well, I'm not going to go to hospice because of that. And so we don't want to really threaten the availability we have to patients who need palliative care. Uh, so that's one issue. The other issue was we don't really want to make it uh, untenable for, say, one of our staff members who, you know, let's, I think, I don't really understand the total philosophical underpinnings of, say, the theologic, you know, argument as far as being a Catholic on this, but obviously that's an issue for, say, Catholics, and we don't want to make it impossible for a Catholic to work in our hospice organization. So that's another concern for, from a staff side. Um, but, um, so we're exploring this issue and learning about it, I think, at this point. Um, our national hospice organization does sort of, it has a four-page <coughs> sort of difficult to understand. Um, uh, I wouldn't you know, bore you with four pages of this, but the summary at the end is resolved that the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization does not support the legalization of physician and assisted suicide. Now that's not necessarily what I, I do I believe that an individual hospice has to do, but that's sort of where they're at as far as the national level. Um, and those are our concerns about it. Not, it doesn't mean we would never you know, be involved with it or something, or never uh, advise a patient that this is available, but, but those are our concerns about it. Marianne, um, I want to um, speak to this. One of the things that I think we in Missoula have had the benefit of over the years mm -hmm. is um, the work of Life, Life's End Institute and um, the opportunity to talk about end of life issues for many years. The thing that's interesting to me is um, at this point, um, we're more interested in wanting to talk about end of life and um, what, what I'm finding is we're talking not so much about palliative care hospice but um, advanced care planning. So for example, when your mother would have gotten a diagnosis, it wouldn't have had to wait until the end when she says I'm done, but some conversation all along the way about um, how do we live, um, live life knowing this about my health. And, um, and you know, I'm not so sure about legislation and I can have conversations about um, human dignity and, and um, being created in the image of God and what dignity is and all of that and, um, and some theological principles. Uh, but at, at, at the very basis is how do we talk about our lives progressing at an earlier point so that it's not in the last six months of saying I'm done um, and I'm you know also with you in terms of there are vulnerable people that um, that need advocate advocates to speak for them um, so uh, you know I find myself um, on the one hand um, in administration at St. Pat's which is um, a faith-based Catholic hospital um, that's easy for me to be able to this is what we will do at St. Pat's. This is what our physicians will or will not do based on what we believe. And then, um, you know, certainly personally, um, it's not that black and white. And um, we have our family members and we have our, our personal thoughts about um, 
what does suffering mean? And we got pain, but what is suffering? And how do we how do we work through our our issues with our families and and ourselves that um, that are important as well? So. Um, I wanted to move on to the second question as a segue. Did you have a final language? I just point wanted to you? say one thing in response to Eric, mm -hmm. and that is that uh, I think that everyone who supports uh, physician as as assistance in dying um, respects uh, would a would absolutely respect the 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 right of any physician to say, no, I, this is not something that I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that they would also respect, I certainly would, mm -hmm. and I put it in the legislation, <laughs> um, that, that hospice mm -hmm. could say, this is not something we do. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's fully appropriate. I mean, I think it's, I think it's appropriate for hospice to say, mm -hmm. um, this is the thing we do for people. Um, and it's one of the many ways that you can mm -hmm. contemplate how you're going to approach the end of your life. Ho hospice does not do this in Oregon or mm -hmm. Washington State. It's done by family physicians 90% of the time plus at mm -hmm. home, and it's not done by hospice personnel. Um, just a small point again by way of perspective for the audience. Even in Oregon, which has had this as a legal option for 12 years, uh, the number of people who resort to this, you have to understand, is very, very small. This is something that's available to a tiny subset of people who are in extreme distress at the end of life. The, 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 uh, the literature quote, uses this quote frequently, no one wants to die a moment too soon. It's only when that person is trying to weigh the, 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 the options knows what's coming if uh, death is not hastened. They can make this decision. In, in Oregon, if I'm re recalling correctly, the number of people who approach a doctor and get a prescription, whether they use it or not, is less than one in a thousand who die. So it gives you a sense. We're not talking about this is routinely used by lots of people. Um, uh, and the, the bottom line, that, that from a philosophical standpoint, I think those of us interested in the ethics of this need to consider once you think about how this might apply in your life or my life or your mother's life, whatever it is, who gets to decide? Just a factual addendum there. The uh, latest summary of the Oregon Death with Dignity Act from 2009 reports that in Oregon, 88 prescriptions were written for lethal medication under their law and 54 patients um, and eventually took the medication. 22 died of their diseases and 12 were still alive at the end of the year. So just to give you a sense of the numbers we're talking about in the state of Oregon. Um, let's, um, we'll get a chance to pursue these lines of thinking um, through the other questions that we have, but let's move on. The, uh, the second question that was posed to the panel regards one of the major lines of objection to uh, physician-assisted uh, aid or aid in dying is in, namely that policy cannot be so tightly formulated as to protect against certain abuses or practices harmful to vulnerable populations such as the disabled, the elderly, or marginally competent individuals. So a um, question for the panel then, what, um, in this vein, what abuses should we be most concerned about and can legislation really be written to adequately protect patients? And I think I'll start uh, with um, Bernie and back to Marianne on this question. Um, what my organization does is Disability Rights Montana is we represent Montanans with disabilities and there's about 157,000 Montanans that, that could potentially be available um, for our <coughs> services. Um, and one of the main things that we have done over the last several years is we have gotten involved in end of life decisions in which we intervened in 11 cases and we came out with this report that says withdrawal of life sustaining treatment 11 case summaries. And what our, one of our primary objectives, we filed an amicus brief um, in opposition to the Baxter decision. Not because we aren't civil libertarians, because most of the time we're on that side of the equation. We believe in autonomy, we believe in self-determination. However, we're concerned when you balance that self-determination and autonomy against a group of people who may be, and in our experience, prematurely determined terminally ill. 
When someone says to someone, you're terminally <coughs> ill, something happens to the way you think about your life, and you think about how you progress in your life and what you're going to do. In the 11 cases that we participated in and intervened, these people were prematurely determined terminally ill, and after we intervened and advocated, only one person actually met the definition of terminal illness. Judge McCarter says in her district court opinion, terminal illness is easy to determine. Well, not in our experience. Terminal illness is not easy to determine. There's a gentleman that is sitting in this room tonight that has been diagnosed terminally ill six times. Guess what? He's 37 years old and he's among us today and he should have died when he was six. <coughs> six times. But he's here in the audience tonight. I'm not speaking because I'm fearful of abuse. I'm speaking because of our experience that determining terminal illness is tough and it's hard. And people with disabilities may in fact, and have in fact, experienced premature diagnoses. Coupled with that, doctor, in all due respect, I don't think the law is about, should be about making doctor or doctors comfortable. I think the law should be about holding doctors accountable for their diagnosis. I think that right now, in the privacy between individuals who experience terminal illness, whatever that means, and the privacy of their doctor, I think decisions are being made to help people through those end of life tough choices. I'm not sure that by codifying it in a way that puts people with disabilities potentially at risk, as we know happens, is going to benefit, as you have so rightly said, a very small group of people may want this right. Yet, this small group of people, we're going to allow them and help them get that right when the collateral damage of that could be a whole host of people that may in fact be <coughs> prematurely uh, determined terminally ill. I have two more points. People with disabilities that live their lives, live their lives with a lot of pain, live their lives with conditions of incontinence and other things that other people without disabilities believe is not dignified. And yet people with, di with disabilities believe that they live dignified lives, and they often value their lives at a much higher level than their treating physician does. I'm not sure I'm, stop and think about that for a second. So if you have doctors that are not, don't value life the same, or as some of you may say, if I get into an accident and I can't walk, I don't want to live that way. Well, there's many people who live that way and have quality of life that is tremendous, productive. Our main <coughs> objection is that the risk to people with disabilities who could be prematurely found to be terminally ill is our main concern. Our second concern is access to health care. Instead of talking about dying with dignity, we ought to start talking about living with dignity. Meaning that everybody who has a disability and has a particular condition, disease, or illness ought to have the right to equal access to health care, equal access to palliative care. And I could go on all night, but I meant to be respectful <laughs> to the panel. So my last point is that for those of you who understand Medicaid in the state of Montana, there are certain services that are optional services and some things that are mandatory services. Fortunately, in the state of Montana, we have chosen that palliative care is we will cover that. The state will cover that type of care. Make no mistake. As shrinking our shrinking economy and things become more difficult to access, that is an optional service that the state does not have to fund. If the state chooses to withdraw palliative care, you have a whole group of people who 
when looked at, when they see the terminal illness diagnoses, and they think about the economic disadvantage that they are at, and the potential impact to their family, I don't think that's a decision made with an awful lot of consent. I think that is a coerced decision. And I think we really need to grapple with what are we really talking about? If we have equal access to health care, the complete spectrum for every person, then maybe we can start talking about ending people's life. But let's talk about living with dignity, and let's talk about protecting people's access to that care, and not spend a whole lot of resources and time for those few people in Montana who may want to access that right. And there's a lot of people with um, disabilities out there who are very fearful, and they're not fearful based on fear alone. They're fearful based on their experience of going to a doctor and the doctor saying, or to their family members, God, he's really outlived his life, or maybe the quality of his life, I'm not so sure about that. I think we really need to step back and think about what possible protections, if we're going to move forward, could we put in the law that's going to protect people with disabilities, or women. Women are the other group that are economically disadvantaged and don't have access to health care. That's the other group. And I think we need to roll up our sleeves and talk about that. And I purport that there basically is no, there's very few safeguards that we can really put in place at this point because I still think we need to know more. So, thanks. There is a number of great <laughs> points for debate. Let's have a little <laughs> conversation about this. Um, Stephen, I think you were in your signal first. Um, well, I, I, I agree, actually, with most of what you have to say. Um, I think it's just a different way of looking at it. The patients that you talk about who are here are not terminal, um, and they shouldn't be. And you need to keep in mind that for every patient, disabled or otherwise, this is an individual circumstance, mm -hmm. and that everybody has to be taken individually, and that these patients were thought that their lives were not of value or so much value that is completely outside of the system that we're talking about. In fact, I'm quite sure that things can be drafted which would exclude your concerns properly <coughs> done entirely, if done <coughs> properly. And again, I would give you the over 400 cases that have already been through this process that did not include such people. Now, to know when someone is going to die is a difficult problem. In some situations, you can know better than you can others. In the case of people who are dying from malignancy, from cancer, when they come to be very preterminal, then you can have a fairly good idea. You can be <coughs> quite certain of that. That's an entirely different category than somebody with a chronic disability. I, and I agree with you, doctor, except that yeah. <coughs> so, these are misdiagnosed. You have, to, you have to be careful with that. In mm -hmm. fact, that's one of the problems with all of this. How can we know <coughs> right. that someone has six months? Cancer, we can be fairly certain of. Some chronic pulmonary diseases, uh, we can't be so certain of. And the second case that's, that uh, is the most second frequent case that <coughs> comes to physician-assisted uh, dying is uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Those patients are difficult. They're miserable. Um, so you have to be very, very cautious about that kind of selection. But the people with disability do not need to be fearful of this sort of thing, really. And there is an enormous problem with health care, which has to do with the fact that we have better treatment. People are not dying from natural causes. Uh, people are dying from chronic illnesses because of modern medicine. So we prolong suffering, we prolong death, and so the whole category of individuals that come to view in terms of how we die and when we die is the whole changing concept in the totality of health care. And all of that needs to be addressed because this is a component part of that. Uh, I guess I, I 
agree as well. I, I don't know um, as much about the issues um, in, involved in um, determining when someone is terminally ill, but um, certainly I think that uh, there's not, I don't think there's anything at all inconsistent with being both a supporter of physician assistance in dying and universal equal access to health care. There's nothing inconsistent about those at all. And I don't think that we have to solve one problem before we solve the other. We have to solve them both. Um, and so, I, but, but I, I just don't, I, I don't think that they should be placed in opposition to one another. The other thing that's striking to me <coughs> is um, that we despair about uh, the possibility of, of, of providing safeguards in this situation. And yet what we have in the case of Oregon and Washington is a heartfelt attempt to provide exactly those safeguards and repeated assessments of whether those safeguards are working or not. And yet we have, we have patients with all sorts of rights as terminally ill patients. Patients have the right to refuse treatment. Patients have the right to, uh, as I said before, to starve themselves to death. And there's no safeguards there. There are very few. I mean, if a family member wants to manipulate a patient into refusing uh, treatment, well, uh, or refu refusing tr treatment, they, they can do that. And there's no safeguards. If anybody is leading the way in terms of providing safeguards against these kinds of abuses, it's the people of Oregon and Washington who have done that in the case of physician assistance and dying. Um, let me jump to our other legislator here. Did you want to um, add anything to the question about the, the possibility of safeguards? Well, the issue we're continually dealing with in the legislature is what's called the principle of double effect uh, or unintended consequences. So how do you adequately anticipate everything that's going to happen by a particular legislative action uh, for every single possible contingency. And uh, in, to my way of thinking, two states out of 50 is not a sufficient track record to uh, sufficiently identify and protect vulnerable popu popu populations, as Bernie has indicated. Um, so, and then, of course, uh, from uh, perspective, is always this consideration of uh, what does the whole issue say about how we determine the value of a human life, and ultimately, does it lead us down a road of considering <coughs> that life's only, uh, life only has value, provided that it has some uh, some type of economic or um, uh, material production that it provides in the marketplace. And so this issue of the, those, uh, the, those vulnerable individuals, whether they be with disabilities, uh, of whatever sort, becomes quite critical. And uh, so all of those things, uh, I think, have to be uh, considered uh, in, in a great deal of uh, intricacy. And I'm not quite sure in a 90-day session of the Montana State Legislature then we can adequately do so. So uh, I would urge great caution in regard to the whole discussion. Uh, the, I, I'm not so sure that I necessarily disagree with the availability of physician assisted suicide. But what I do have a very strong feeling about that is until I disagree with um, Representative um, Barrett, in that I think the health care system does need to be fixed first because the collateral damage will occur to those vulnerable <coughs> populations because if people do not have access to, then they become coerced into making decisions. It's an unlevel playing field. You could also, though, um, raise the question that mm -hmm. when um, you have the, in, the increasing financial incentives under, uh, 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 under any form of access, that, that we might that we might have under a public you know um, uh, within healthcare and healthcare reform that the incentives would be there to uh, end life because the end of life is so the much more the most expensive part of of medical care that the incentives already exist and would be even greater 
to keep healthcare costs down to push people toward the end of life. It could go the other way as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to um, make one, one other comment about the idea of um, that this is a right that is going to be extended to a very, very small number of people. And I, I don't think that's correct. If this happens, it's going to be a right that is extended to every Montanan. Whether they choose to make use of it or not is another story. But when we're talking about rights, we're not talking, we're talking about something that is the right of everyone. And I, I think it's a mistake to think that because only a small number of people take advantage of it, that depriving people of a right, the depriving 900,000 people of a right is a matter, is a trivial matter. Um, let's um, transition, unless, uh, Mary, I don't know no, if you wanted to, um, <laughs> let's transition into the, this um, question number four then on our program for uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so, and then we'll see um, the audience is uh, um, still hanging with us here to have a few questions. The, uh, basically, this last question has to do with looking at how, how um, legislation supporting physician assisted assistance in dying would affect both uh, positively and negatively the values of our community and the values of the healthcare profession. Uh, so looking at this issue from the perspective of community values, which values are enhanced by the Baxter decision and which are threatened, which professional values in the moral tradition of medicine are enhanced and which are threatened. The, uh, the decision uh, of the Supreme Court and um, also in the in the district court, um, both suggested that it, there was a state interest not only in protecting vulnerable populations but also in uh, the the tradition and ethics of of medicine. And so I think that's a perhaps a, a good place to begin. And um, I know Marianne and S Stephen both have indicated interest in speaking to that. So um, Marianne, did you want to speak first? Well, I guess I would begin by saying, um, although my experience isn't um, all that vast, that, um, that the physicians that I've worked with over the years are, um, are very compassionate and um, not looking for ways <coughs> to protect themselves first, but, um, but always thinking about um, what is best for their patients. Um, and certainly there's um, some sense of, of their own profession, et cetera. Um, so one of the things that I find, and I, and I would say I had a situation with one of our uh, physicians just today, um, um, having one of um, their patients approach and ask about physician-assisted suicide and, um, and, and sitting down with this physician and talking through um, <coughs> what, does, what does this person really think and believe about this? So, you know, so... Um, I don't have a, a, a firm, I guess, answer to the question other than acknowledging that there's, so, there's just so much um, inner conflict beyond just what the laws are. What do I think? What do the laws say? How do I really think? So, so St. Pat's protects me, so I don't have to say I'll support it because I can say, well, we're Catholic, so, so that I don't have to deal with it. Um, and that's not necessarily, um, you know, the best answer to that whole thing either. But we're at the, I think on the one hand, beginning to really think about what, how will this help us? And what are going to be the challenges? And, um, and my sense is the opportunity to come together like this, to sort through the issues, to think about um, listening to everyone along this panel, um, finding myself agreeing with everybody and yet falling on <laughs> one side of the, um, of the uh, spectrum. And, and that's probably true for all of us. So we're all coming at it, you know, what's, what's the good for us as individuals? And we can fall on two completely different sides of the, of the issue. So. I would like to respond yeah. a little bit to that. I would just say from a physician's perspective, I would disagree a little bit that this issue is just about what's good for the patient. I would be very afraid to 
be um, prosecuted yeah. for murder, and that would be a huge disincentive for me to even think about writing a prescription. <laughs> And, and to sort of subject my life to a year's prosecution and showing up for depositions, that would be a huge disincentive to ever think about what's best for the patient if I thought I'd be convicted for murder one. And I would imagine most physicians in the room would agree with that. No, and I appreciate that. Yeah, what and I'm I saying is you know, I would not be thinking about, I'd be thinking about me, number one. On but that you're not, not compassionate at the same time. What's that? You're not, not compassionate. Right, I think I'm still compassionate, but I would be very th thinking about me. <laughs> I want to spend time, you know, in an orange jumpsuit. I mean, literally, that's how it would be. So in order, in order to be a physician, you'd rather yeah. not be in jail. Right. Yeah. So, so from that perspective, it would be very much about Appreciate number that. one. <laughs> so. I, I guess what I, I outlined about four answers, which, which are individual answers that, that in, in summation reflect community values. Uh, so I'll just sort of read those off. The one is the self-determination that we've talked about, which is a, a value that, that is it's an ethical principle of uh, medical behavior that the patient should have self-determination. This transferred into their lives totally to include medicine, but having the freedom of self-determination does affect society. Um, the business of having a continuous physician care for you, to know you, be involved in your dying process is very, very important. That patients are abandoned can be abandoned, feel abandoned toward the terminal part of their life because there is no mechanism, professional or otherwise, to respond to their dying can be a major issue. All of us in medicine have seen people who've shot themselves, who've failed to try and commit suicide in difficult situations. This is an under table kind of thing. It happens all of the time. It's very unfortunate and it's a, a, a part of society that we don't deal with very well at all. The privacy, coming back to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. issue, is so important. Our dying is the most personal, private, sacred experience of our total individual life. And for community to come together and family and understand as more of us are getting older and more of us are having terminal illness that we need to emphasize and understand and spend time with the business of our dying as a component part of our life. This would be enhanced with it. Um, I think that's... Yeah, and, um, I guess one question I might ask in a very practical sense and then I'll transition to audience questions but take the moderator's prerogative here. Um, I mean, one of the, the arguments about the effect on the moral tradition of medicine, some see physician-assisted dying as, uh, as promoting the abandonment of patients by physicians because there's nothing more I can do for you, here's a prescription. Um, and in fact, if I understand the Oregon law correctly, the law does not require physicians to be present when the medication is taken. So it's, it, it is a, here's the prescription, and it, and, and it also does not require, of course, any notification of family, um, although it's encouraged. So there could very well, it seems to me, be this sense of abandonment, and I could see the concern there. On the other hand, you can really see this very much as an issue that um, promotes yet another way for physicians to be compassionate uh, and to, uh, to help patients who want to have this particular choice. So I guess that, um, you know, the question of how you construe it may depend on, on how physicians actually carry this out. And maybe one question I might, might have is, should there be a requirement then in the law that physicians be present or in some, uh, in some other way attend more adequately to their patients? Maybe that can't be legislated, I don't know, but so that, so that we really don't have a, a, the sense of abandonment. I, I think that's a very good question, and uh, as I first became involved with this issue many, many years ago, when we had a, a debate in this town maybe 20 years ago between Ira Bioc and a person named Timothy Quill. And you all are probably familiar with Timothy Quill. Like, Timothy Quill is one of the most wonderful physicians that I have ever met. 
and who cared about patients and he uh, is one of the people who's at the forefront of all of this and, and one of the things he said and I agreed to is exactly what you're saying and he said it ought to be so that the physician could be there. Things have been developed in Oregon not to have the physician there, I think, for political reasons, because it seems too active, too present. And one of the arguments is that the prescription is given, the patient voluntarily takes that prescription in the confines of their home with the family around, and the physician uh, does not need to be present. And I suspect that that's a, a politically motivated decision, <coughs> which is the case with how this fits with physicians. You know, physicians are involved in, in, in death all of the time, and we talked about the double effect when patients are terminal, they cannot stand conscious living anymore, their circumstances are horrible, and so we tell the patient if they can understand or the family that we're going to give you this morphine drip, and we're giving it because the pain is severe and you can't stand it, your family can't stand it, we have to put you to sleep, but you are so sick and so terminal, it may be that you'll die with this. Um, and in fact, the real intention is that the patient is so bad that they will die. It's not said that way, but that is the intention, because we can only say it that way. Because the last thing you want is to have the person go on like that for another five hours because it's miserable and people can't stand it. So physicians are playing a role in aiding patients in dying all the time. And everybody agrees with that. The attorneys agree with it. The public agrees with it. The patients agree with it. Uh, the Catholic churches agree with it. It happens every day all over the country. So we're actively involved in things like that. Uh, so. How does that compare to being there with the patient? So it's kind of an analysis of how we are as a society. One, one last thing. Um, a, I just came across some data that's interesting about how physicians are, which I think is more political than ethical. Uh, a poll was taken in Seattle with the first initiative in Seattle about enacting physician-aided uh, dying. And there were 400 doctors who were sampled, and within that group, 65% um, of the physicians said that they were in favor of it. 75% of the physicians said they didn't really want to be involved with it, <laughs> but they were in favor of it. 70% of the physicians said that when their time came, they'd like to have it available. <laughs> <laughs> just, just very, very quick. This is in the early 90s. I think the values question is one that um, is the whole idea of quality of life and how, how is that going to start shifting and how those decisions are going to start being made and what are going to be, what are we going to be communicating as a society about what is, what is tolerable in terms of living and what's not tolerable and who should be, and how those pressures play out. We already have a lot of those unconscious messages happening, and this is a very active way to start making those conscious. And I think that that becomes a pretty nerve-wracking thought to think that quality of life is now going to start being measured somehow. And so that's a values thing that I, I think I'm concerned about. And it's certainly been present in all of my years of my work that I do now. Thanks. Can I um, ask or mention one thing? Sure. We, we sort of had a sort of stimulated by Steve and this issue, um, we had a discussion with, it, with amongst our hospice staff and in regards to the issue of abandonment at that time in life. And even though I would say certainly our organization is not ready to start, you know, prescribing that kind of medication for our patients, if somebody were to choose to do that and it were legal, it is possible for hospice personnel to be there and to assist the family at the time, you know, even though the patient might take the medicine themselves and may have been prescribed by another physician, there is precedent for hospice personnel being there at that time and kind of assisting the family through that phase. And it may, uh, a lot of times, um, you know, there are a lot of things to do at that point in time, and that includes uh, uh, kind of, uh, 
you know, preparing the body and things, and also <coughs> sometimes, it, it, you know, just in talking with family and making sure they have arrangements and everything. It's it's a very common time of need for the family, you know, uh, at the time of death, and um, so we sort of feel that. You know, potentially as a hospice organization, we wouldn't necessarily abandon the person if they chose to to do that. So, in that sense, you know, you could avoid some sense of abandonment. Um, I want to. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. I just want to make Very one good. last comment for myself. Um, what we're talking about is what we think as a community the rules should be. They're going to apply to all of us. And what I wanted to, to have everybody understand is what the rules now are. We know what we talked about what the rules pertain to Aiden Dine are right now. But here are other things to help you understand how Aiden Dine fits in. These are other things that we as a society over the last 50 years have decided should be choices that the individuals should make for themselves. You can, in our society, if you're mentally competent, you can refuse food and water until you die. Okay, no doctor can force you to take it, even though he, he has a goal perhaps of of uh, encouraging you to, to continue your life. You can refuse medical treatment, even simplistic medical treatment that everybody agrees could prolong your life. You can, you can decide in our society and, society, and the government cannot refuse you this choice. You can decide, I don't want that. I'm prepared to let my life go to its end. You can require that if you already have these medical interventions, we call this pulling the plug, but if you have those medical interventions and the doctor says, if we take away that respirator, you will die. Otherwise, you will not. You, can, you have the right in our society to say, I want it off. Okay? As Stephen has alluded, um, we know that in our society, when someone has terrible terminal agony, one thing doctors do is they pr provide uh, powerful narcotics to, to treat the pain. If the narcotics are not enough, and that often happens, we know that the doctor can, at the patient's request, increase the morphine to the point where predictably respiration stops and you will die. You have that right as well. And finally, and we argued a lot about this to the Supreme Court and the medical experts and affidavits talked about this. Finally, in our society, terminal sedation is, is legal. That means that if you are in agony at the end of your life and you are one of the unfortunate people who cannot be, uh, the, the pain cannot be addressed or the pain or the breathlessness or the incredible nausea, whatever it may be, can't be addressed through conventional means, what the doctors will do is they will sedate you. It's called terminal sedation. They'll make you unconscious until you starve to death or you dehydrate to death. That happens all the time in our hospitals as well. It's a sad thing. And in our, in our case, the thing I wanted you to understand is we're not advocating <coughs> as a legal matter that people should ac accept or embrace aid and dying. What, we're say, what we say is you should have that choice. In Bob Baxter's case, Bob Baxter wanted that choice, and he couldn't have it. He died a difficult death. What we're saying is that, that every life is valuable. And when we talk about if you're suffering, you only have so many days left, how much value is that? Our answer, my answer is, you're the one who should answer the question. Okay. Um, I've gotten word that uh, as the evening goes along, we have time for, we'll take a couple of questions. Um, so I'll have to be quite random about this, but um, uh, keep your questions very, very short and succinct, and um, we'll try to get a couple of, two or three of them in here. So, yes. I'd like to direct you, Mr. Moore, more than anything else, but you were the only one that actually brought it up, <coughs> is, is involving religious aspects when, when you're dealing with making this legislation. Uh, I'm curious as to how, as a legislator, you can use religion or, or inject your religion into these decision-making processes in order to incorporate everybody? It's a good question, but ultimately the issue of metaphysics and uh, the discussion of um, uh, philosophical positivism is not, it's not religious. It's not, it's philosophical. It's a philosophical consideration about uh, how we look at life itself and how we look at uh, the system in which we live because you have to go back and you have to understand some things about uh, Greek philosophy and the whole idea of Western civilization based upon the, the thought processes of uh, ultimately Aristotle and Plato and that was the uh, that was the means from which the whole Hellenization of Western culture occurred in conjunction with 
what became Christian thought through uh, in all this, then we branch off into a whole discussion of theology. But ultimately, the issue of metaphysics is not at all um, theological. It's a starting point for theology. And I don't, I completely respect your concern that you're articulating, and, and it's not my role to inject uh, my uh, religious posture into the, uh, onto my constituents or anyone else. It's simply to make judgments based upon issues that have some moral value and uh, ultimately, hopefully, I can do so in a philosophical manner uh, more so than in a theological manner. Thanks. Yes. I, I wanted to take issue with the, the comments about that we have lots of data for more about it because by the Department of Human Services on admission in Oregon, they really don't have, have good data. They typically, the law <coughs> required um, that there be data collected from doctors, but there was no penalty for underreporting. so if a doctor doesn't report, there's no penalty. The, the data is collected largely in, with questionnaires and phone interviews. There's no investigation of medical records. Once they collect that information, that information is, is destroyed once they issue the annual yearly report. There are not the resources in Oregon to follow through with underreporting or noncompliance um, by any of the physicians. None of the physicians who have refused to provide um, prescriptions have been interviewed so that we know whether or not their refusal was because of a, a personal bias or because they simply did not feel somebody met the criteria in terms of whether or not they were they were terminal. Um, there were not families who were interviewed so that if people did, for instance, doctor shop because maybe if the, the first doctor, two doctors did not agree, then uh, that someone was terminal and would not therefore write a prescription, the doctor they end up with may know nothing about them and the families are not interviewed, nor are the people interviewed before they, they um, die to, to get, again, more data about how things are being used. In addition, in terms of terminally ill... So, can we just address the data question? Yeah, that, well, and this I was, was going to say about that there are people in, in, in terms of the terminal illness, there are people who, at, after two years, still had not used a prescription. So they clearly were not terminally ill in terms of what is commonly um, thought of to be terminal ill. <coughs> okay, good. Um, one or two people on the panel want to address that? I know Steve and Dick have talked about this. That's not the, I've investigated very carefully and that those, that's not the uh, information that I have. I have that? citations for everything. I so come from the DHS reports as well as testimony that was purpose. offered before the legislature as well as the law itself. So, so I guess we have a disagreement about the facts here. So anyone else want sure to? The position was presented. Um, any, anyone else want to address that question? Yeah, one more question. Okay. Um, in the back. Oh. Okay. <laughs> My name is Dustin Nick. I am. The only criticism I can make about this panel right now is there's nobody like me on it. I'm terminal. I have to shed muscular dystrophy. I was diagnosed in 1978. I'm 35. My brother died when he was 26. Um, this process kills me. Um, you say we don't have to be afraid, but I have to say that that's wrong because I have Medicaid and SSI. I'm like bottom of the bottom of society. And ever since I was diagnosed, the system has dictated almost every aspect of my existence. I cannot get married. I can love someone to death. I can't marry anyone because the law says that their income will count against me. They can remove my insurance. I can't get married. Second, the state will only pay for me to get three showers a week. If I want a shower every day, I need to have something to provide share it to me to go beyond that. 
I can't say that. All I can say is every time I've ever had an incident where I crashed, I've had a pneumonia once, twice, hot breathing. You talk about value, but it's about every time that doctor looks at me. It's not about that person is living and he deserves to live. It's more about what kind of favor would I be doing him? Now, I can't tolerate that, but I can say one thing, which is why this kills me. Um, the values you're talking about is about the value I place on my life versus the value placed on my life. Um, basically, is it what I want or is it what others want for me that matters? Is it my decision? I don't do fear. I'm not worried. I'm not scared about that. That, that went away so long ago. But I can say this. Um, I need to know that the value I place on my life is more important than anyone else's value they place on it for me. Whatever decision that leads me to. And if you're going to make a law, if you're going to make a regulation, that needs to happen. And I don't care what you need to do to make that happen. But it's got to be the value that is intrinsic, not opinionated, not relatively plain. So I do want to say one thing. It's a question. I said all that so I could say this. Okay. <laughs> um, is it your opinion that uh, positivism leads to ultimately nihilism? Is it an aspect or intrinsically? Does positivism lead to a nihilistic value outlook? Uh, it certainly can because the perspective becomes one of uh, what would be called purely intramundane, that we're in a closed system, basically deny the validity of the concept of a soul. So yes, very well, we need to deny those. Well, that's a very big question. Anybody want to Well, I really appreciate you folks for staying for such a long time. We wanted to extend the evening a little bit because we had quite a few panelists and we wanted them to all have a chance to speak. And I think, uh, you know, these folks volunteer their time and I was really impressed by the compassion, thoughtfulness, and courtesy in which they dealt with this very difficult issue. And I also was very impressed by your attentiveness in staying here for this long time. And this is a weighty issue and I, I appreciate all the thought that went into our panelists and thank you for being here.